right, I guess I don't need the microphone. Um, all of you know me, and you know I've been the I've been the the, the guy concerned with Syria uh, in Madison, bombarding everybody's email inboxes with all kinds of stuff. That's, that's a bad metaphor, Dave. <laughs> oh. Forwarded, um, and um, my name is David Williams. For those who will hear this um, program, it is being recorded both by uh, WORT Radio for future possible um, broadcast, and it's also being videotaped by Russ Otto in the back. Well, where's uh, the makeup? From WYOU, <laughs> and, and Russ has. A program called Third World Issues, which uh, broadcasts on WYOU community cable TV on Saturdays at four. Right, Russ? So at some point, uh, this uh, this program will appear on WYOU uh, TV. So I want to thank both Norm Stockwell from WORT and Russ Otto from WYOU for uh, for making sure that this event tonight will go out to a much bigger audience uh, than the folks that are, are here. But I, I want to thank each of you individually for, for coming here uh, tonight. Um, the, uh, the Syria is, as the poster says, is a three-sided civil war. In many ways it reminds me of the Spanish Civil War, you know, where uh, there was a you know, a fa uh, uh, and I'm showing my biases here, but there was a fascist-like, uh, you know, a force on one side, there were uh, forces on the other side struggling for uh, democracy and, and for progressive change, uh, and then uh, there were, were uh, foreign powers that were arming either side. It was kind of a, a bit of a proxy war, the Spanish Civil War, uh, in the midst of which the progressive the radical forces of the Spanish Revolution were, were, were attacked. They were fighting Franco, they were fighting fascism on one side, um, and, and on, from the, then they were stabbed in the back, in my opinion, uh, you know, by uh, other forces that uh, were aligned with, this, with Stalin and Stalin Soviet Union. And so uh, there, I think there are some comparisons. Uh, it's also a war in which we're having as Americans, basically, to sit by at helplessly uh, and watch uh, massacre uh, going on. Uh, one side heavily armed, the other side poorly armed. Um, uh, about, uh, the destruction of an entire country. Um, you, just about everybody here knows where I stand on this issue and what I think should be done. But I'm going to be the moderator of this event tonight, so I'm going to try and set, put my biases aside. Uh, I may have something to say, you know, toward the end of the discussion to kind of throw in my two cents, but uh, I want to try and, uh, and be fair here uh, and allow all points of view uh, to be uh, presented. And um, the way we're going to run it is the uh, panelists are going to uh, each speak for 10 up to no more than 15 minutes, initial presentation. Then we'll open the floor for questions and comments. I think since we, uh, we're a relatively small group, uh, I'll just at some point, if, if I feel there's a need for a, a time limit in terms of qu uh, questions or comments from the audience, as well as responses from the panelists, uh, I may uh, suggest that at a certain point. We can go as long as, you know, Stamina and interest allows us to go, okay? So our first uh, speaker tonight uh, will be Danny Postal, uh, someone I've had the privilege of knowing for, uh, what, almost 30 years? Well, 25 years. 1990. Right, 1989 or 90, I met Danny in Chicago. He was fresh out of Beloit College. Uh, we, were in, we became involved with something called the Green... Uh, Left Green Left Network. Left Green Network. And this was predating the Green Party uh, <laughs> USA. And then in the mid-1990s in Chicago, we both became very concerned with what was going on in Bosnia, a situation, again, which I think has parallels to what's going on today. 
And so we were kind of in a minority on the left in Chicago in terms of urging some kind of Western intervention uh, to, to stop the uh, ethnic cleansing and the massacres that were going on in Bosnia. So uh, we, you know, we're, we're bonded that way. Uh, Danny is the associate director of the University of Denver uh, Center for Middle East Studies. And he, he along with Nader Hashemi, is the co-editor of the book that some of you have now, uh, The Syria Dilemma. So. Thank you so much, David. And thank you, everyone here tonight, for coming out. Um, on a uh, not particularly uh, pleasant Saturday night. There are so many other things you could be doing tonight. So um, I appreciate your presence here. And as David said, um, we've known each other for quite some time now, about a quarter century, going back to our days in Chicago. Another point of connection between us is that we worked together on the volunteer collective at the late New World Resource Center, um, Chicago's then only radical bookstore, um, sadly no longer in existence, but um, David used to run um, reading groups, uh, discussion groups about different works of radical theory and left politics. Uh, those were absolutely formative uh, in my own intellectual political development, um, and we've stayed in touch over the years. Um, and so it's, it's fantastic uh, to be back in Madison. I went to college, as David mentioned, just down uh, the road in Beloit. And, um, and that's when I also met Norm Stockwell, uh, whose presence here this evening brings me great delight uh, as well. Um, W-O-R-T uh, uh, retains a very special place in my heart and always will. I also worked in radio for several years in Chicago. Um, so it's great to know that Wart is here tonight. And I also want to say um, what an honor it is to be on a panel uh, with Amit Paul, whose work I respect enormously. And I want to thank the, Pro the Progressive Magazine um, for co-sponsoring this evening's event and helping spread the word about it. And I say this because um, Amit has actually written some of, in my view, some of the very best uh, essays about the Syrian conflict that one can find, um, broadly speaking, on the left. Um, his essays in the Progressive Magazine uh, on the Syrian nonviolence movement and his attention to the issue of Syria, um, I think, really stands out in the literature. And uh, that's why we're all here tonight, because we've been in dialogue about these things. Our views are, are not exactly the same, as you'll soon uh, find out, but that's okay. We we are, I think, broadly speaking, um, uh, on uh, in 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 very deep agreement about I think the fundamental underlying issues. Do I still might have my scarf on? That's funny. <laughs> that's how cold I am. You see, you can see I I'm no longer really a Midwesterner. I just moved to Denver about a. I'll just throw this over there. I just moved to Denver about a year and a half ago, and I guess I've softened. Uh, uh, but it's uh, it's it's great to be here. So let me say a little bit about this three-sided conflict, although David actually said a lot of what I was going to say. And I suggested to David that we put that in the very title of the event this evening because I think this is essential. One of the narrative uh, threads, one of the constant messages, refrains that one hears these days across the political spectrum, interestingly, it's, it's a common view both on the right and in certain quarters of the left and in sort of mainstream discourse. It's a, it's a lazy formulation in my view, but I think we need to confront it head on, which is the idea that the Syrian conflict has become, or in some views always has been, essentially a conflict between Assad and the forces of is Islamic extremism. Pick your poisonous, uh, you know, description, Al-Qaeda, jihadis, um, fundamentalists, etc. Um, this view was actually the first, I think, um, player in the Syrian drama to suggest this view was actually Bashar al-Assad himself. And he said it um, immediately after the Syrian uprising started in March of 2011. Um, let's recall, and I think it's absolutely essential 
to dial back the clock for a kind of clarity about uh, that period, that initial moment of the Syrian uprising, which uh, my colleague Nader Hashemi will talk about in some more detail. But let's remember that the initial uh, phase of the Syrian uprising, the first seven to eight months um, from March 2011 until about the end of 2011, that initial phase of the uprising was nonviolent. There were no jihadi extremists involved in it whatsoever. It was non sectarian. And it was, broadly speaking, democratic in spirit. Um, and it was at that point, immediately, that Assad not only unleashed a paroxysm of repression, um, but he also characterized the uprising as a foreign plot, an extremist operation, as a threat to Syria. That was false then. It has become less false over time for reasons that we can get into, partly because Assad himself um, helped engineer this self-fulfilling prophecy by opening his jails and letting uh, some, uh, a number of jihadi uh, militants out of Syria's prisons, um, pr a prison system that Human Rights Watch characterizes as a torture archipelago. That was a characterization that applied to the pre revolutionary Syrian landscape. This is not a new phenomenon, in other words. Um, so why do I mention this? Because um, I, believe, I have been saying for years now that the conflict in Syria is, in fact, not a conflict between the forces of Assad's killing machine on one side and Islamist militants on the other. That is a false characterization. It has been um, a false characteriz characterization from the very beginning. Um, but I think what, what we see now is that it's not just that there is a distinction to be drawn between the original, if you will, rebel um, movement, loosely organized under the banner of the Free Syrian Army, on the one hand, and these Islamist factions, jihadi, militants um, on the other. That was always a distinction, but now it's an operational, categorical distinction, which is to say there are shooting battles taking place daily between the Free Syrian Army factions and s several different kinds of jihadi militant groups. This is exactly why I think David is correct to draw the parallel with the Spanish Civil War. Um, and we can talk about that more in the discussion, perhaps. But I think it's just very important for the purposes of, for purposes of clarity. What are we talking about when we talk about the Syrian civil war? This is not a two-way war. This is not Assad and the opposition or the rebels. That is no longer the case. It was at one point. But because of the Islamization or uh, jihadization or al-Qaedaization um, of elements elements of the Syrian uh, uh, uprising, you now have a three-way war. You have Assad's fascist killing machine, the fascist forces of al-Qaeda, and then you have, broadly speaking, groups that grew out of the original Syrian uprising, loosely, again, organized under the banner of the Free Syrian Army. Now, some would argue, and do argue, that because of this Islamization, jihadization, the growing influence of the al-Qaeda elements in Syria, that it's such a mess, it's such a maelstrom, it's such a nightmare that we, whatever we might mean in the case of US national security um, types, they mean the United States. But those of us uh, on the left, um, you know, it's interesting. What do we mean when we say we? We can talk about that. Um, but I would say internationalists, people of conscience, progressives, um, people who feel that our fate is bound up with the fate of our brothers and sisters struggling for justice in other parts of the world. And I get the feeling that everyone in this room um, would probably fit that description and feel that way. I think that when 
we look at the Syrian landscape and say, well, there's just no one to stand in solidarity with. There's no one to support. It's just, you know, different groups of murderers, uh, different groups of, of thugs. Uh, it's it's a religious war. It's a um, it's a bloodbath with no uh, no clear you know no clear uh, boundaries. It's too hard to make sense of, um, and therefore, you know, we just we don't have anyone to side with. I think that this is a, a problematic view. I would actually argue that because of the Al Qaedaization, the rise of influence of these jihadi elements in Syria, if anything, I would argue that this would suggest the need for more solidarity with the original democratic struggle that animated the Syrian uprising and those forces who continue to struggle for those values, those principles, those goals. Why would we argue for less solidarity? when they are now facing a twin battle. They are now against not only the Assad regime and its killing machine, but also against the other killing machine of the Al-Qaeda forces in Syria. So this is a situation in which actually they need more solidarity, more sympathy, uh, more, in, more engagement, critical solidarity to be sure. Um, and we can talk about what that means perhaps later. But I would argue that actually um, the situation in Syria and, and the deterioration uh, uh, of the Syrian conflict um, with the growing rise of al-Qaeda really demands of us much more critical solidarity with um, the original democratic forces that, um, that are still struggling every day, struggling against both Assad and al-Qaeda. Um, let me just say a few words and then I'll, I'll uh, conclude about the one of the most nightmarish aspects of the Syrian conflict, which is what the activists are now calling the starvation sieges of many, many areas of Syria. The numbers are um, hard, to, how, hard to pin down. Some estimates are that quarter of a million to 300,000 Syrians um, are trapped in these besieged areas with no access to food, humanitarian aid, medicine. Actually, the UN has just um, issued a statement saying that it could be as many as 800,000 Syrian civilians, civilians, non-combatants, trapped in these besieged areas um, all over the country, but around four particular uh, parts of the country. So this is a nightmare. Sty Syrians are starving to death under these sieges. You have a situation where um, one Muslim cleric recently ruled that under such desperate circumstances, Syrians in good faith are allowed to eat cats, dogs, and donkeys. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. The desperation is unfathomable. Uh, the malnutrition, these emaciated bodies of children, of old people, of young people, it's just harrowing. Um, I encourage you to um, to, to, to look into this. So um, how can this happen? These besieged areas are surrounded uh, mainly by Assad's forces, but also in some cases by uh, rebel militias, um, particularly Al-Qaeda affiliated groups. Um, these civilians are starving. They cannot get out to get food or medicine and doctors and humanitarian aid workers can't get in to deliver food and medicine. Um, every major organization in the world um, that follows the Syrian crisis has issued calls for, a, for the lifting of these sieges. Human Rights Watch, the International Crisis Group, the Red Cross, um, and in fact the United Nations itself. This is a war crime. This policy, which the activists describe as a kneel or starve policy, a surrender or starve to death policy, is in clear violation of the laws of war. And of course, it's just a moral obscenity. Um, but it also happens to be a war crime. Um, all of these organizations, including the United Nations, have called for a lifting of these sieges, but they haven't been lifted. Why? Because the Assad regime refuses to lift them. So I would just simply pose an old-fashioned question originally posed by a major 20th century figure. What is to be done 
about these sieges. Now, I think it's fair to say, and Nader and I disagree about this, but I, I don't think at this moment there is going to be a solution to the Syrian crisis at large. There is simply not a consensus in the international community at the level of geopolitical strategy. There are too many conflicts between the US and Russia, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We're at a stalemate. The, the war is going to grind on. There is going to be more death and more suffering. We probably, as horrific as the situation in Syria is today, we probably have not seen the worst, not even close. But I do think that we can chew off a bite of this nightmare by focusing on this humanitarian crisis and this particular question of the starvation sieges. This is simply, I think, unacceptable from any ethical, humanist, humanitarian uh, point of view that one can imagine. Why should these civilians trapped in these besieged areas be forced to starve to death simply because of Russia's geopolitical calculations or Assad's seemingly metaphysical intransigence about this. I simply don't believe that there's any argument for this. I think that, and I'm sure this will be controversial in this room, I believe that the United Nations Security Council should pass a resolution explaining and laying out a plan of action, explaining to the Assad regime that it has 48 hours to comply with the lifting of these sieges. And by the way, this is a message not only to the Assad regime, but to any combatants in Syria who are blocking, who are trapping these civilians inside these death traps, preventing the delivery of food and medicine to them. Any armed actor in Syria involved in this obstruction and preventing people from living, from eating, from surviving, I believe should be taken out by force. Now, I would like to think, and by the way, let me say that I believe that the simple threat of force will probably be enough to allow safe passage and humanitarian access into these areas. We saw in the fall that for all of his bluster and intransigence, Assad actually does not want international military intervention. In the case of the chemical weapons issue in late September, late August, early September, um, when Russia um, came in with this proposal to solve the chemical weapons issue in the face of Obama's threats of a military strike on Syria, Assad was all too happy to hand over the chemical weapons that he didn't have. Remember, he had insisted that he didn't have chemical weapons, but all of a sudden he was very, very eager to hand them over, the weapons that he claimed he didn't have. He handed them over, or agreed to hand them over, um, along the lines of the Russian deal. He didn't want a U.S. strike. I believe that if the United Nations Security Council were to uh, lay out this plan of action and put Assad and the other forces on the ground on warning, that there would be military consequences for blocking this humanitarian aid and food and medicine into these besieged areas. I believe that the Assad regime would comply. But I think it's going to take something like the threat of the use of force in this highly circumscribed and very specific way to make him comply. Um, I think some of the jihadi groups actually might not comply, frankly, because Assad is a criminal mass murderer and a fascist, but he's not completely detached from reality. He does want to hold on to power. He has a very specific uh, political axis around which he revolves, which is the survival of the Syrian state, such as it is. The jihadis have no interest in that realm of reality. They are involved in an apocalyptic, metaphysical struggle. They, these are the kinds of people who kill vac vaccination workers in Pakistan. If they block or kill or harm these humanitarian uh, aid workers, um, you know, I, I, which I think they could and might, I have no problem with them being taken out if it means that people are allowed to live. I do not believe that fascist murderers should be allowed to prevent food 
and medicine getting into civilian areas. I'm sorry, I just don't. Now, I know that's a controversial view because it might involve the use of violence, but I think there are some things that are worse than the use of this very limited form of violence. The mass slaughter and starvation of civilian populations, I think, is much, much worse than the threat of and possible use of limited airstrikes against that very tactic. That's my view. Um, we can get into the operational details later. It's very possible that Russia would block uh, the passage of such a UN Security Council measure as it has done. It just said the other day it's not interested in, in pursuing this at the moment because this is not the time. So there might have to be something outside the legal framework of, of the UN Security Council and, and the responsibility to protect concept might it might be time to dust it off and, and, and bring it back from the dustbin of history to which it was consigned largely, I think, by Iraq. Uh, and we can talk about that. Uh, it's complicated, but at the end of the day, I don't think it matters to the Syrian civilians who are starving to death how the legal and geopolitical um, pieces are assembled on the chessboard. What matters is that they're dying, they're starving. And I think that those of us who believe that we have a responsibility, you know, Desmond Tutu said, very poignantly in my view, that the suffering of Syria shames us all. And those of us who come from the internationalist tradition, we believe that we have a stake in struggles going on around the world. People on the left who say, oh God, um, we don't have a dog in this fight. We're not on anybody's side. This is just too crazy. To me, that's a right-wing view. That's an isolationist view. Uh, that's Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin said, let Allah sort it out. This is a cold-blooded, realpolitik, isolationist, America first position when it's articulated by Rand Paul and Sarah Palin. But there's kind of a weird left-wing version of that that I think is deeply, deeply flawed. I think that we do have a stake in Syria. Now, we can agree or disagree, as I'm sure we will and do, about the specifics, the nuts and bolts of what policy specifically would be most beneficial. But I think the principle, the idea that we have no stake in what's happening in Syria is absolutely an abandonment of internationalist ideals um, and of just human decency. Um, so I think we really need to think seriously. If, if my proposal, the proposal that Nader and I are making about how to get aid into these uh, besieged areas is flawed, uh, if people have better ideas, uh, we are wide open to them. And we're not saying that this is, this is the only way, but I think we have to come up with something because the present situation in which people are starving every day in these besieged areas is simply unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Uh, our next speaker is Amit Paul, who is the managing editor of Progressive Magazine, and there's free copies of the Progressive available at the table out there. He's also the author of the book, Islam Means Peace, which is available at the counter in the back. Uh, and he uh, is coordinator, I believe, of the uh, Progressive Magazine's um, Progressive Media Project. Progressive Media Project. Uh, he wrote an article in, uh, it was posted on the Progressive website in August or September? In September. On uh, giving nonviolence a chance in Syria, which I believe you can you can still access yes. on the Progressive website. He also has been teaching a course in um, media ethics at um, Edgewood College. On and off, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, thanks, David. And uh, I wanted to uh, won't take me long. Uh, divide my talk into uh, two portions. The first is a critique or a comment on the book itself. And uh, I must point out that uh, uh, Nadar Hashmi and Danny Postel's book was chosen in The Progressive as one of the best books of uh, 2013 by a contributor to the magazine, Bill Fletcher. And I think that's very warranted because um, it really raises the question, as Bill Fletcher said, of what to do. And it provides no easy answers. There are a range of perspectives, uh, somewhat diverging. Uh, mainstream perspectives like from Farid Zakaria, uh, much more progressive voices also. And, but it does raise that dilemma. That's, the, of course, the title of the book. And uh, makes you think, uh, and makes you think outside the box, and uh, not in simplistic terms. 
And uh, I love the quote in the book from an Israeli diplomat who said that with Syria, the ghosts of the Balkans and Rwanda are vying with the ghosts of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, I think that's so true, and that uh, encapsulates, in some sense, the, uh, the, the dilemma that we all face as to what to do in Syria. And the Bosnia thing, actually, the reference was uh, uh, really brought back to mind for me also. Uh, what I was involved in as a grad student in the early 90s, which is to bring about intervention in Bosnia of one sort or the other. And again, even there, I was uh, outnumbered. Uh, and I remember being kind of annoyed at the progressive magazine at the time because they had a very hardline isolationist perspective. And even the nation did, if I remember correctly. More uh, or less with one dissenting voice, Ian Williams and Richard Falk. Yes, Richard, okay, okay. Who's yeah, in this book also. Yeah, who's in this book also. And, uh, you know, uh, Assad is a monster. And I don't think there should be any illusions about him. He may be secular. He may be socialistic in some sense. He may be having some social welfare programs, but you run down the list of his human rights abuses. I mean, he started off uh, with torturing kids for writing graffiti, pro, pro sort of, you know, pro-democracy graffiti. This is a guy. I mean, you know, you can go down the list to cluster bombs, battle bombs, uh, you know, uh, mass abuses of children. Uh, as Richard Falk, uh, who's a great progressive international sort of law scholar says in this, that, uh, and it's still true, the book is of course, uh, you know, I mean, he wrote this uh, about a year or so ago, that the preponderance of abuses, not all of them, obviously, we all are aware of that, but the preponderance of abuses are by uh, the regime itself. And that's something that really we all have to face and sort of contend with. And, you know, he's managed to stay in power. Uh, perhaps uh, Professor Hashmi can talk more about the various sort of strategies that he's used. But in the end, basically, and Danny stole that uh, Sarah Palin comment uh, that I was going to use. As she said, you know, let Allah sort it out, which is a plainly uh, Islamophobic, xenophobic type statement. And I'm afraid that uh, the progressive uh, sort of uh, a portion of the uh, progressive community has its own version of that, that, you know, yeah, you know, they're all sort of, you know, uh, insane. And there's nothing we can do about that. And... Um, I think we should, we have to think harder than that. Uh, there are no easy answers. I don't have sort of a ready-made sort of answer myself, but to sort of, you know, just, and here's where I, you know, I can publicly say I disagree with even my colleagues in the, uh, in the Progressive itself, uh, in the Progressive magazine, because they have much more of an, uh, let's sort of, you know, a hands-off uh, approach than I do. And uh, which is why I, uh, I guess there hasn't been a public debate uh, between us uh, in the pages of the magazine, perhaps, uh, you know, there needs to be because they're much more open to some sort of an intervention than they are. <laughs> the, the second portion of what I was going to talk about is uh, what my book is about, you know, deals in depth with, uh, uh, it's uh, about nonviolence. Uh, in the Muslim world, that's what my book is about, and you're welcome to purchase a copy, uh, hint, hint. <laughs> but, uh, but what I'm going to sort of deal with here is just Syria and the tradition of nonviolence there and how it's been overlooked, of course, because of you know the uh, the horror of what's been happening, and the media has not given even it's 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 a durable, sustained, small strand, but a strand that I think needs to be paid much more attention to. Uh, and actually, one of the foremost uh, uh, theorists of nonviolence in the Muslim world is a Syrian, Jabdat Said. He's actually Circassian. He's a Circassian uh, a Syrian. And the reason that the circassian thing comes to my mind is because uh, there's uh, Sochi. Uh, there's, uh, I've written about the circassian genocide which happened out there, and these people were dispersed all over uh, uh, the Ottoman former uh, Ottoman Empire, and his ancestors went to Syria. And he's actually used uh, this maybe of interest to you all a story that's very very familiar to Christians. That's uh, Cain and Abel, mm -hmm. and he's used that, and he's uh, uh, one of his books is titled "The Doctrine of the First Son of Adam." Because he says, why can't we all be like Abel and uh, sort of, you know, and not use force even uh, in reaction to violence being inflicted upon us. Uh, an amazing person has done a lot of uh, work in, uh, uh, that's been published in Arabic, unfortunately less so in English. But there's, there's uh, certainly some uh, material available by him. He's in his 80s, uh, came to the United States, did a tour in 2012, actually went back 
to Syria, even though he's been imprisoned a number of times, a remarkably courageous man uh, who, uh, along with his sister, has done, as I said, uh, path-breaking work uh, uh, on nonviolence in the Arab world. And his tradition continues. You know, there's a Syrian nonviolence movement, which is kind of an umbrella organization, which has done a lot of great work, uh, civil disobedience, flash mobs, um, you know, the Syrian nonviolence movement sort of, the uprising in Syria started off with a nonviolent uh, gesture, which is these kids writing graffiti. Uh, Professor Moja Kaf, who's actually at the University of Arkansas, who's done a great sort of, that's available online, and you can link, it, uh, link to it from my piece, once you get access to my piece online. She's done a great uh, 30, 40 page paper on nonviolence in Syria, and she says, that I get so astonished when people ask me about nonviolence in Syria because they don't know how it all started and they don't know that it still dis persists the strand in, in Syria and how ignorant they are because they've been uh, not sort of following it carefully enough and they've just been bombarded with this news about uh, violence in Syria. And, you know, she's so very true. So, you know, there have been uh, dignity strikes where people have uh, protested in various forms throughout Syria. There's been resistance. Uh, remarkably to these fundamentalist jihadist groups, non-cooperation with them. They've been women who have participated in good numbers, youth who have participated in good numbers. They have negotiated uh, you know, safe havens or sanctuaries in some small instances, unfortunately not on a national scale. They've done relief work. They've done sort of creative action like you know, um, unleash bags of red paint in Damascus. Uh, to protest, you know, the violence that's been happening out there, the dumb strikes. So all of this is persisting. Um, you know, unfortunately, of course, as we know, it's not the dominant strand, but it's not a strand that's invisible also. That's for us to sort of keep in mind. Um, I definitely, you know, this is a strand that needs to sort of enlarge itself. We all know that. But at the same time, we all need to be aware of it. Uh, they need, of course, you know, to engage in more boycotts, and we need to show solidarity with such groups. Uh, in one way or the other. In fact, uh, Professor Kaaf says that that may be, may be, possibly may be a way out, you know, the way that uh, an international sort of boycott, divestment, sanctions uh, strategy helped in South Africa is currently uh, sort of, you know, also active in the Israel-Palestine movement. Maybe that's a way out, you know, and, um, you know, to quote somebody famous, you know, Either we sort of have optimism of the will or pessimism of the intellect, and I am all for the optimism of the will. And you know, we need to just hope that you know, in the end, uh, you know, the nonviolent strand that was predominant in the early stage, as Danny points out, will come back, you know, to the fore again, and this this madness will end because you know, there's no other way out, in my opinion. So you know, that strand is there, is persisting, needs our support. And we don't need to fall into these uh, simplistic sort of, you know, uh, categories of, you know, uh, you know, Assad is bad, the opposition is bad, there's nothing we can do. So let's just basically ignore the uh, calamity that's happening in Syria. There are much more creative ways to engage with what's happening out there and sh show our solidarity. Thank you. Our third speaker uh, is Nader Hashmi. Uh, since I am an amateur uh, scholar, more a librarian than a scholar, um, collect a lot of books, I have done a little reading uh, of, about the Arab Revolt, the famous Arab Revolt of 1915-16, which, you know, was uh, romantically portrayed in the movie Lawrence of Arabia by Peter O'Toole. So I just assumed that Nader was from that illustrious Hashemite <laughs> dynasty, <laughs> you know, swept northward and you know, and and helped bring down the Ottoman Empire. But he's actually originally from Iran, uh, and he is the director of the University of Denver uh, Center for International Studies. He also is an associate professor in the um, is it School of International Studies here. Yeah. Studies uh, yeah, cool. there as well, and he is co-editor uh, with Danny of the book, The Syria Dilemma. So I give you uh, Nader Hashemi. Can you stand? Okay, good. Good, thank you. 
Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, as was mentioned, I come from Denver, and if you want to gather a few people on a Saturday night in Denver to talk about something serious and political, you're going to have to bribe them. Uh, so I'm really impressed that um, there's an audience here tonight. Uh, I really want to, I came here because I want to have a discussion and a dialogue with the audience. Um, David um, was gracious to sort of organize this event. Um, he asked us to say a few introductory remarks, so I just want to make a few sort of broad points as to why Syria matters why this is a cause that's important, why we should pay attention to it, why we should be in critical solidarity with um, the Syrian people. Um, the first reason is um, somewhat obvious. Um, Amitav sort of hinted at it. But um, Syria today, if I can just read you a, a quotation, Syria today has become the great tragedy of this century, a disgraceful humanitarian calamity with suffering and displacement unparalleled in recent history. Um, not my words, but that's the uh, assessment of the United Nations. Specifically, that's a quotation from Antonio Guterres, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. The facts and the figures speak for themselves. According to conservative estimates, over 100,000 people have been killed in the last three years. Um, approximately 40% of Syria's 23 million population are either internally displaced or they've been turned into refugees. Uh, the United Nations uh, is reporting that 75% of Syria's population is in need of humanitarian aid over the coming year. Um, um, you know, barrel bombs, um, the, uh, um, the, the use of sexual violence on a massive scale. It was reported that 38,000 people just last year appealed to the United Nations um, in Jordan, among the Syrian refugee, I'm sorry, in, in Lebanon, among the Syrian refugee population, complaining and, and needing assistance for um, um, sexual violence, rape. Um, we often forget, I think, one of the key sort of characteristics that has been forgotten, and it shouldn't be forgotten, but I think is very reflective of sort of what we're facing, the moral stakes of the Syrian conflict. Let's not forget that this regime, headed by the Assad family, you know, not too long ago, gassed his own population. Um, we now know it happened more than once, but the major attack was on August the 21st. And rather than, um, you know, arranging for his quick, you know, um, exit uh, to the, uh, the Hague, um, where he deserves to be, he was given a platform in Geneva to, you know, justify the policies that uh, have been inflicted on the Syrian people over the last Three years. So if you look at simply the, the facts and the figures, um, look at the human rights violations, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the UN Special Commission of Inquiry have published over the last three years approximately 30 reports collectively. Overwhelmingly, the preponderance of evidence that they have accumulated allays the vast majority of human rights violations at the doorstep of the Assad regime. War crimes and crimes against humanity have been state-sanctioned. On December the 2nd, the UN High Commissioner for um, Human Rights, Navi Pelli, said that they now have, quote, massive evidence pointing direct connection between the senior leadership of the Syrian regime and the perpetuation of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, um, and so I say that because among some circles, there is an attempt, a deliberate attempt, for ideological reasons, to blur those lines to make it seem like, well, there are no good guys. Everyone has committed atrocities. And that's true in the same sense that in World War II, all sides committed atrocities. But there's no moral parity between the different sides. Not in World War II, I don't think. Not in the case of Syria. And don't take my word for it. Read the human rights reports. If you go to our center's website, I've actually put all of those reports on the website. You can easily download them. Read them. It's pretty clear. Um, so the human rights, I think, um, dimension, the ethical dimension that draws us to Syria, as to why Syria matters, pretty easy case to make if you just access the publicly available information. Um, um, Syria matters for that reason. But there's another reason that I sort of talk about in the book. And I want to just quickly summarize my essay in the book. I think Syria matters because there are very important political principles involved at stake at the heart of this conflict. And that's fundamentally the principle of self-determination. Um, the modern history of the Middle East has been deeply shaped by the struggle, the deep desire among peoples of the Middle East for self-determination. Um, the legacy of colonialism and imperialism that shaped the borders, that shaped the borders of Syria, 
um, left a deep imprint in the um, um, political identity, the psychological sort of orientation of peoples throughout the region. There was this sense, particularly in the Arab world, that their political destiny was hijacked and shaped by the intervention of European forces that prevented people in the post-World War II, post-World War I period, from exercising the right to self-determination. The dominant theme in the Arab world from you know, World War I right up until, I would say, 1969, 1970, into the 70s, for a good chunk of the 20th century, the dominant theme in the Arab world was the desire for self-determination, the desire for an independent, united, broad Arab state. Those desires were thwarted by the policies of the great powers. This desire for self-determination is deeply ingrained in the political consciousness of people. That connects with the Israel-Palestine conflict in the sense that the Palestinians now are struggling for self-determination. It's the one area within the Middle East where self-determination uh, has been denied a, a, a group of, uh, of people as a result of external intervention. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, the, the Israel-Palestine conflict fits into this broader sort of set of political themes that have characterized modern Middle Eastern politics. But after you know, the ending of World War II, we saw the gradual receding of European control. And you have these nominally independent states that emerged throughout the Arab world. And what happens very quickly, broadly speaking, is you have these you know, independent states that come up. They're post-colonial states. But the political elites, the ruling elites that come to power, you know, are nationalist, they're broadly secular. And within a short period of time, they start behaving in ways that are eerily s similar to the old colonial powers. They're repressive, they're dictatorial. Yes, their names were all sort of Arab and Muslim, but the way that they related to the broader society was very similar to how the European colonial and imperial powers used to behave. One set of rules if you were in power, and if you were connected to power, if you weren't, you were basically second-class citizens. And so you have these authoritarian, repressive regimes that come to power, and in the case of Syria, it's a case study of what I'm describing. By 1970, there's a coup. The Assad family comes to power. And there's basically been one family in power for the last 44 years. And one of the interesting things that really struck me when I was reading about the Syrian uprising that began in 2011 was how there was these repeated references by Syrian intellectuals and human rights activists to the theme of internal colonialism. What did they mean by internal colonialism? They were describing the Assad regime as an internal colonizing power. <laughs> because it was behaving in ways that were eerily reminiscent of the former French imperial power in the case of Syria France. And so that really, I think, was in many ways what produced the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, broadly speaking, in all of these societies were motivated by the desire for democracy, social justice, and dignity. But it was really you know, motivated by this ongoing, unresolved question. People felt that in the 21st century, they weren't allowed to shaped their own political destiny. It was always thwarted by some other force, either a European power in the early 20th century or in the post-colonial period by these ruling elites that had come to power and anyone who spoke up and sort of had a different opinion, you were crushed. In the case of Syria, this is a very, I think, important and sort of unique sort of characteristic of the Syrian situation because if you draw a line and you try and rank Syria in terms of its human rights record under the Assad family, you know, Syria can be uh, situated and should be situated at the extreme end of a spectrum of repression. Arguably, Saddam Hussein's Iraq was worse in terms of its human rights record. Now, I think after the last three years, it's a toss-up between which one, you know, um, um, can claim to be the worst human rights violator um, in the post-colonial era of the Arab world. Um, and so, if you spoke up in Syria, you you ended up in a very ugly place. Um, so, you know, the prison conditions, the human rights violations, a really nasty sort of um, uh, record. Um, and so that's why I think the, um, the, 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 the Arab Spring began, why it happened everywhere, and why it happened in Syria, because people were motivated by this fundamental desire for self-determination. And if you are sympathetic to that desire for self-determination, if you uh, believe that's an important principle, then self-determination, I think, has to mean much more than simply empathizing with the struggle for democracy and the struggle to overturn and repeal and roll back and distance um, a society's connection from an authoritarian, repressive regime. It also means, I think, at a much deeper level, um, you have to support and listen to organically connected, democratically minded Syrians who were involved in the uprising, who launched the Arab Spring uprising, 
who I think are uh, the type of people that I think can lead Syria to a democratic future. And you listen to them. You listen to what they have to say with respect to their desires and what they want from us as an international community. Um, they want sustenance, they want support, but they are also at this time are calling for external intervention to save them from what is, in my view, a fascist regime. Um, now, that's very uncomfortable for a lot of people, but I don't think you can fully be in solidarity with um, um, a group of people. Um, and you can't fully, I think, um, support the right of self-determination unless you're actually willing to sort of lend an ear and not put your own ideological preferences ahead of what people on the ground are actually asking. And what they're asking for us, from us, broadly speaking, is they want um, military help to stop the atrocities of the Assad regime. Um, over the last four days, just to say one example, it's a small piece of the big story. If you're following the news, over 150 people have been killed in Syria as a result of these barrel bombs that have been dropped from helicopters over Aleppo and in other areas. Those barrel bombs coming out of largely helicopters um, could not fly, could not, those barrel bombs could not fall on people's heads, killing you know, hundreds of people if some political force, military force, were to take it out. That's what the Syrian people need at this moment. Could you say exactly what a barrel bomb is? Sure, it's these sort of manufactured bombs filled with you know, nails and pellets and sharp objects. It's like oil drums. Oil drums, okay. and they're dropped from airplanes. There's actually some good stuff on YouTube if you email me. There's some really good uh, video that sort of traces and she sees the, the effects. These were happening in large numbers at the end of last year. Um, as you know, as the Geneva Peace Conference was moving forward, Assad wanted to sort of, you know, and they have devastating effects. They're dropped on civilian quarters, and they have sort of these really type of, you know, um, you know, catastrophic consequences. I think, you know, just from listening to the news reports, probably close to a thousand people have been killed by them over the last three or four months. So it's like a so-called anti-personnel. Anti-personnel weapon. weapon. Um, you know, there was a really powerful piece that I just read the other day by Frederick um, Hoff. Um, who um, um, is with the Atlantic Council, and he said, look, you know, um, had Obama followed through with the proposed military strike in September of last year after the chemical weapons attack, maybe those helicopters and aircraft would have been knocked out. How many thousands of Syrians would be alive today if that type of action would have been taken? Well, we don't know, but we do know that Syrians are dying today. And what Syrians are broadly asking for us, asking from us, is support to stop the atrocities that are killing, according to, as I said, the most conservative estimates, over 100,000 people. Um, so self-determination, I think, fundamentally matters. And if you really believe in the principle of self-determination, then you have to listen to what the Syrian people are actually asking for, asking from us. And they're asking for, at this moment in time, um, even those on the extreme, I think, um, nonviolent end of the spectrum, some of the people that Amitabh mentioned, uh, I know some of the Syrian activists, and they're not happy about this. It, you know, their political convictions are challenged, but some of them are saying, look, we want to live to see another day, and unless someone comes to our rescue, we're not going to be able to see another day. Um, and so that's why um, I think without some sort of military intervention. And ideally, I would love to see that military intervention come from an impartial country or entity. You know, I really wish that there was this rapid deployment force yeah. that located, was situated in, let's say, Switzerland or Sweden, <laughs> and then we could call upon them you know, <laughs> when, when populations were facing neo-genocidal conditions. But unfortunately, that's a world that we don't live in. Um, um, we live in a different world, and if the Syrians are going to be able to live to see and stay in this world, someone is going to have to listen to what they're asking for, support them. Um, no one's talking about an invasion. No one is talking about Iraq. What most Syrians are saying is we need air cover. We need to take those aircraft out, stop the barrel bombs, stop the bombing of cities, stop the bombing of red lines, and they need arms to defend themselves, to defend particularly the moderate Syrian opposition that uh, is the weakest element in the military balance of power on the ground. And I think unless that happens, then um, Syria and the Syrian people are headed for a very dark 
future. Um, and so that's what my Syrian friends tell me, broadly speaking. I know there are Syrians who have different views, but most Syrians, I think, who I think are representative of public opinion. I'll just give you an example. I mean, Danny and I hosted in, in Denver, and I'll end with this, the really good you know, journalist Max Blumenthal. Uh, he wrote a nice piece in The Nation um, at the end of summer, right? At the end of summer, where he um, went to one of the major Syrian refugee camps in, um, in Jordan. And um, he was interviewing people, and in the, in, in the course of his piece, you can look at it online, um, he said the Syrians were telling Max that, you know, this is right after the chemical weapons attack. We want Obama to use his air force to hit Assad, to stop these atrocities. And if he's not going to do that, we want Obama to bomb us in Jordan. Why? Because we don't have a life here. We're on the margins of existing already. If you're not going to sort of take out the tyrant, then at least take us out, because this life that we're living is not really a life that's worth living. That's what the, I think, Syrian refugees uh, were telling Max Blumenthal. I think that's a perspective that many Syrians share. And I think that's a conversation that I realize can be very uncomfortable for many people in this room. But if you want to be seriously engaged with the real world that is affecting Syrians today, you have to be able to engage in that conversation. And you have to be able to put your own ideological preferences behind the actual needs of the Syrian people today. And I think that's what critical solidarity means, and that's what really supporting self-determination in the full sense of that word actually means. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, open it up for uh, questions and comments. I'm going to start out being pretty loose as a, as a chair. Uh, uh, if, 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 if necessary, you know, I may uh, uh, suggest some more uh, stricter uh, rules, uh, but I, what I'd like to do is ask, you can make a question or a comment, and if you have a, a, a comment, uh, I would say keep it to about three minutes if you would, and uh, it, if it's a question, also indicate whether it's directed to a certain member of the panel or whether it's directed to all of them, uh, and if there are a lot of people who, you know, have questions and comments, I may take a stack, but I think what I'll do in the beginning is just, you know, the old-fashioned way, just, just, just call on people one by one. Uh, Adam? First of all, I want to thank the three of you for coming out on a cold night like tonight, and I want you to know you're not being discriminated against. Um, uh, I do a lot of anti-intervention activism, and um, Right now, there is no peace movement, no anti-intervention movement worth um, diddly squat in Madison in terms of people turning out. Uh, so, in fact, you get a t you're getting a typical quantity of people. So, please don't take it personally or in terms of the Syrian cause. The second is I want to thank David, who's over and over again organized these forums. I'm going to suggest in the future you might try being on campus because I think at least we might tr attract some more students and maybe members of the Syrian community on campus. By the way, that's our fault because we were only available on the weekend in this particular case. And so um, we on, on weekends, it's hard, I think, to get a crowd on campus. And so uh, it's we take the blame for the, 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 the limited availability. No, OK. I'm, there's a, a much wider discussion here, so I'll just throw out a couple of concepts with you. I think the three of you managed to skirt some of the major problems uh, of the Syrian, what you call, dilemma. The first thing is that since the end of the 19th century, or during the 19th century, most of the boundary lines in what we call the Middle East make no sense ethnically, linguistically, even in terms of common economies, and so forth. When you talk about self-determination, my particular uh, partisanship is in favor of Kurdistan. Uh, Syria as it exists today would, it doesn't correspond at all to the historic core of uh, Syria. If you go back before the Ottoman Empire and, and during and since. Um, and one of the problems is I hate calling everything fascist and I wish the three 
two of you at least would just drop fascist from the vocabulary. <laughs> I don't think the Syrian regime even understands what the def dictionary definition of that is. <laughs> the strong man rule. Um, as for the violence, everything is relative. Even though 100,000 people haven't died in Qatar, um, uh, I guess it's Qatar where the 600,000 uh, Shiites are at the mercy. Bahrain, Bahrain, Bahrain. Bahrain yeah, yeah. You're correct, sorry. Uh, senior moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, in Bahrain, is 600,000 Shiites at the mercy of uh, 200,000 Sunnis. Um, in other words, it's a region in which, to some degree, what's happening today is a fundamental issue of the unraveling of the phony boundary lines and arrangements made by past imperialisms during the ages of empire. Um, and there's no way of stopping that. It's going to happen. In some ways, the, uh, the Islamists are more honest about the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, they at least talk about that the true Arab, Sunni Arab, uh, state that ought to exist, forgetting about the caliphate accent, uh, aspects of it, is something in which the boundaries of Jordan, uh, Lebanon, uh, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Iraq would kind of disappear, and there'd be a very different, very different boundary encapsulating all of the Sunni regions. Now, you can't blame the huge ethnic and, and religious sectarianism all on either fascism or a dictatorship, or the Western powers. It is. As I've tried to explain to my friends, got to look back at Catholic Protestant wars, 100 years of war in Europe. This is the working out in current time of centuries old religious conflict that never had a chance to be resolved, if you will. So I think part of obscuring what might be done in Syria is um, obscuring these fundamental underlying issues. And therefore, it makes it much harder to see your way clear to any solution. Uh, I myself feel that, the, that the, the issue of whether or not the US should have conducted the one day or two day bombing raid and taken out all the helicopters and the, the airplanes and so forth obscures these underlying things. I, I myself feel, if I were in charge of the Syrian moderate opposition, I'd be saying to Europe, you either help us now, or we guarantee we're going to make sure that 5 million Syrians reach, reach common market countries in the next two years. It's already starting to happen. Well, it's starting to happen, but we'll facilitate it. We'll drive them across. <laughs> that would probably get you a faster response than any moral moral argument you might make, because they're terrified of that. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah. So my guess, my thing to you is, how can you reframe everything you said in ways in which there's sort of a logic to what you're demanding? And right now, from what you said, I don't see much logic to it. Okay. Well, in terms of the logic of what we're demanding, for me, I'm not going to speak for anyone else on the panel, how do you stop war crimes and crimes against humanity that have been taking place over the last three years and that continue to take place. That's my first priority. How do you stop those barrel bombs from killing people as we speak? Starvation sieges. Starvation sieges. I mean, people, I mean, between close to a million people now are bordering on starvation. That's the priority. So that's the first, I think, um, issue. And that's why Danny and I have just written this op-ed that hopefully will get published soon somewhere. Um, um, that's 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 the, the priority. In terms of the points that you mentioned, in terms of the you know the history, the borders, the geopolitics, um, I think you are right on some points, but you get many things wrong in your interpretation. Um, um, the borders of the Middle East, as we see them on the map today, um, were drawn by European imperial powers, um, um, and despite these sort of very atrocious origins of this Middle Eastern map. Basically, you know, um, um, a map that was written to please the political and geostrategic interests of European powers much more than the desires of the people on the ground who weren't consulted. Um, several generations have been born and raised in these um, colonial design borders. The vast majority of people in the Middle East, the vast majority, um, while acknowledging those, I think, very um, illicit origins of the borders have accepted the borders 
as they are. Nobody wants to rewrite the borders, redraw the borders, except, except, for, for, the, um, except for the Kurds, for obvious reasons, because they were the one minorities who should have had a state, were divided up between many states, and been treated really badly by the post-colonial states. They have a deep desire for um, an independent state, for redrawing those borders so they can get some justice. But um, with the exception of the Kurds, and with the exception of the extreme end of the Islamist spectrum, and this is where I would correct you when you said that the Islamists you know, are more honest because they want to redraw the political map. That's actually not an accurate statement. The extreme end of the Islamist state, uh, groups, the mainstream vast majority of mainstream Islamist expression, Muslim Brotherhood movements, um, Shia uh, Islamist movements in, across the Middle all of them have accepted the borders. They're, they, are all, they are all what I would call and what I do call in my classes, they are all religious nationalists in the sense that they have a religious identity, but they're nationalists in terms of the focus of their political project or the internal borders, the internal politics of their own countries. They do have solidarity and expressions with other sort of movements around the world, but no, none of them want to redraw the borders. ISIS, the Islamic State of you know, Iraq and the Levant or al-Shams, you know, they want to, but they are non-representative of mainstream political Islam. They are the extreme end of the, um, of the Islamist spectrum. So, um, um, there are these underlying, I think, sort of themes that are there in history, but they're not the themes of trying to redraw the borders. That's not what's motivating people. The fundamental motivation of the Arab Spring, as represented in events that began in Tunisia and swept across the region, were the themes of, you know, dignity, democracy, and social justice. It was fundamentally the theme of resisting and rejecting the decades of authoritarian rule, the desire for people to be able to have what most people in the world have today, not perfectly, but some sort of democratic system where politicians can be accountable, where it's not one family in power for decades. Those were the motivating factors. And there is a combination of both political you know, critique and economic underlying issues. It's not a coincidence that in all the countries that had Arab Spring uprisings, part of the core grievances were economic in origin, but of course, people ask, why are we suffering economically? Well, because of the political structure, because of the, the structure of power in our society. So those two those things, are, those, two, those things are deeply linked and connected. I think the underlying politics of the Arab world that, like I said, led to the Arab Spring in all countries, in this case Syria, uh, were not a desire for redrawing borders, but was a desire for political accountability, for um, a rule of law, um, for you know, a constitution that protects rights. Um, those, were the dominant, those are the dominant themes of the modern Arab world, um, not the ones that you alluded to. I just want to add one little point, uh, which is um, on your um, observation about the term fascist, I think um, there's some validity to, you, to your objection. I, I'm probably using the term fascist too loosely. Um, it should be something like neo-fascist or quasi-fascist, but I will say this. The element of fascism in Assad um, the 44 years of Assad family rule in Syria, I would say, are to be found in this really, you know, almost psychotic mass cult of personality that is top-down engineered through a sort of a system of spectacles. This was really developed under Papa Assad, uh, Hafez al-Assad. Um, Lisa Wedeen is probably the leading scholar of this aspect of the Assad uh, family. Um, what was that book that she wrote called? It was The Dynamics of Domination or something like that. But she, she really gets deep into the psychological, the psychodynamics of the Assad family's engineered cult of personality, the sort of um, the deeply sort of demented, toxic ways in which uh, the emotions of the population are manipulated around the idea that this is this family is divine. It has um, uh, it, it is the savior of the of the nation. There are I would say quasi fascist elements to this, um, but I should probably qualify my use of the term fascist. So point well taken. Just to add uh, uh, one point and sort of comment on one uh, particular aspect of your question, uh, the Sunni Shia sort of the 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 conflict. Is not, it's not mainly, and um, I don't want to sort of oversimplify in the other direction, but to a large extent, it's about capture of political and economic power. 
uh, it's not necessarily to do with these supposed deep-seated sort of animosities. Um, there's an Indian sort of political scientist, uh, Musharrul Hassan, who's done great work on Hindu-Muslim relations in India. And he was asked once, how come you know, Hindus and Muslims in India have not been able to rise beyond their religious sort of identities? And he said, look, you know, in, a, in a, uh, at an atmosphere of scarce resources, what happens is that people coalesce around their religious identities in order to capture those resources. So it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily something to do with, you know, that the Shias and the Sunnis can never get along. And of course, in, in, in Syria, it's been the Alawite sort of uh, sect of the Shias who have captured uh, political power, shared it to a certain extent uh, in the economic realm with uh, Sunni businessmen. So that's a large part of what's going on rather than something you know, that's you know, uh, been ongoing from the time of uh, you know, the 7th century AD onward. I think what I'd like to do is, if it's okay with the panelists, is maybe take two questions or comments at a time sure. and just make a note. Uh, that way, uh, so that we, if we go along at this rate, not everybody's going to be able to make a question or a comment. Um, I do want to have the fullest possible discussion. So, um, uh, Mike and who else had their hand? Jim. So, you go first. Okay. Um, I guess this question is pretty much for anyone that understands or is able to answer it. Um, yeah, I'd agree with the other comment about fascism. It has a very specific definition, and to use it indiscriminately confuses the issue. I mean, one component of fascism presumes that there's mass mobilization of the uh, populace and mass organizations, and I don't think that was really the case uh, in Syria. And my question is this. Um, it's known, for example, that during the Cold War, Syria was a very important, or was considered by the Soviets to be a very important ally. And um, there was a lot of repression. There was a massacre, I think, in Hama in 1982 that got very little coverage elsewhere in the world because Syria was such a close society. But I guess my question is this. Uh, during the 67 war, during the 73 war, the Soviets made it very clear that they were ready to intervene with nuclear weapons if Syria were um, under a serious attack by Israel. I'm wondering, do you think the Russians would do the same thing today if there were any intervention in Syria that they felt was not in their interests? Uh, Jim? Oh, yeah. Um, my question is, um, is, I'm glad you asked that because that was another area Where I get hung up on this is because you're talking about self-determination, and here in the U.S. we have an extent of that, but from my personal perspective, that, um, that is a, a manufactured illusion in this country um, you know, by, by, a, by a capitalist landscape of the commodification of everything. Um, and, and in fact, we, we have rather limited uh, self-determination in this country. We're kind of like rats in a maze. And I especially don't think that we have the kind of uh, self-determination to assert uh, a, a collective public will uh, upon our government and its actions. Um, and with that being the framework or the lens through which I look at the situation, I have considerable doubts about the uh, United States um, intervening um, in a situation like this, doing some bombing, and uh, not getting itself involved on the ground. There is an aftermath when you remove a power. You have a vacuum. Uh, there are contenders. These are things I don't have to tell anyone in the room. We all know this. So we're talking about the potential for creating a vacuum situation and I lack the kind of clarity as to what's going to happen in the aftermath. Are we going to see a situation such as, um, as uh, Bosnia, Serbia, where we have uh, UN peacekeepers, uh, Kosovo, uh, <coughs> on the ground, and then these are, are, are farmed out to these uh, private security firms that um, uh, themselves um, uh, perpetuate other types of atrocities. My understanding is that there was quite, and may still be, quite the racket for uh, human um, sex slave uh, trade uh, in, that, in, in 
in that environment, and that was sponsored actually by some of these supposed peacekeepers. Um, maybe my information there is incorrect, but um, that was my understanding. So what are we asking for when we embark on this? We know what we want. It's all clear. None of us have to make this argument. That's a, that's a given. Uh, what is the realistic thing? That, that, what, what, what may realistically happen? And what do you all know that exists that could fill that vacuum uh, so that we wouldn't get into a situation like happened in uh, former Yugoslavia? That was two, right? So you wanted to yeah. just take two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a, just a couple things to say about that. I know Nader has a lot of thoughts on this. I would say, um, with respect to your observation about self-determination, I guess I would put the question back to you. Why, what relevance does that have to the struggle for self-determination in Syria? Does it matter to the Syrian people that Americans are, have illusions about their own self-determination? I don't think it does. I, I don't think that the U.S. military moves for humanitarian purposes, so we're talking about getting that military to move for some other purpose. Okay, I think these are, are, are separate points. I think Nader's argument about self-determination is a political, ethical, historical, and theoretical argument about principles, the principle of self-determination in the Middle East. He gave an historical argument for why self-determination matters, how it figures in to the Arab uprisings, and how we might, how that framework might help us think through what animated the struggle in Syria that began in March of 2011. I just don't think it matters to say, well, we don't really have self-determination in the United States. I just don't see the relevance of that. We, I, Nader is not saying that because the Syrian people are struggling for self-determination, that leads exactly to X policy from the United States. I think that's a very loose connection. And let me, so let me make this point about your other point. I don't think I misunderstood you at all. I think I understand you with crystal clarity. Um, well, what I'm saying is that the question of self-determination, your critique of the illusory nature of our concept of self-determination in the United States is totally irrelevant. No one in the United States is saying um, because we are going to attack Syria or intervene in Syria in order to support self-determination for the Syrian people. Literally no one in the United States is proposing that right now. No one. Not a single American is proposing that there be U.S. intervention in Syria in order to support self-determination for the Syrian people. That is simply not an argument on the table right now. What I'm proposing, I'll just say this for myself, Nader made it very clear where he's coming from. I am not proposing a U.S. intervention to solve the Syrian crisis. What I said in my remarks is that macro, big picture solution to the Syrian nightmare is not on the horizon. It's not happening. The geopolitical stars are not aligning, have not aligned, and don't appear to be even in the realm of possibility of aligning anytime soon. So I've basically moved away from that discussion now into a much more circumscribed, a much more modest proposal, which is simply dealing with the humanitarian nightmare of almost a million Syrians being trapped in these besieged areas where they are starving to death. My question is simply, it's not about self-determination, it's not about toppling the Assad regime, as wonderful as I think that would be. My argument is simply that there should be an intervention, not by the United States alone, maybe even not by the United States at all. I don't care. And by the way, the people starving to death in these besieged areas of Syria don't care who intervenes. That's not on their agenda. They want to eat. They want to live. They want to survive. So, I'm sorry, I've gone on too long. I am not arguing for a U.S. intervention to allow for the self-determination of the Syrian people. I think that's a something of a straw man argument. It's just off base. Yeah, hold on. Um, you know, you've raised a number of, I think, very interesting points, but I'm not really sure what the core of your question is, because you talked about self-determination and the like, problems of the I'd USA. Like should please do. Because it was yeah. obvious yeah. to me. Yeah. Right. Please do. That, that was at least overlooked. Yeah. Um, what I'm saying is I do not trust the U.S. to intervene 
anywhere in the world, and we're talking U.S. immigration here, which I know is different than what you're talking, but there are a lot of people out there, maybe not a whole lot, but there are people out there talking U.S. intervention, so I'm sitting in this room. Um, and um, when we're talking U.S. intervention, I do not trust the U.S. to do what we think of as so-called humanitarian, military intervention. Uh, there, there is very little evidence of the U.S. actually doing such a thing. When they intervene, they intervene for capitalist, imperialist purposes. Excuse me, I thought this was supposed to be a forum. What I'm hearing here is a ping pong. Okay. No, I, I just wanted a clarification of the question. Yeah. That's right. Okay. No, that's 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 the core of your argument. No, you know, you know. Um, I have to agree with you. Broadly, what you have said is, I think, correct. I can't think of an, one example where the United States of America, at least in our lifetime, or let's say post-World War II, have intervened solely and strictly for humanitarian purposes. Um, I mean, the one ca test case is, is the case of Rwanda, when um, we have now quite a bit of evidence that the United States and the, you know, the, the U.S. Security Council had information that there was a genocide around the corner. Romeo Dallaire, the UN sort of uh, commander on the ground, um, was sending them these faxes. And, you know, the Clinton administration, Madeleine Albright at the time, you know, knew it. And basically they decided there's nothing of value in Rwanda for us to intervene. Now, Clinton came to regret it later. But the fact that he didn't intervene, you know, I think amplifies your point. But I think there's more to the story than simply that. Great powers are not motivated strictly by humanitarian impulses. We agree on that. Um, but where they are motivated by their own political interests, their own capitalist interests. But sometimes those motivations can lead to an intervention that can have positive consequences for suffering peoples. I would argue that you know the United States didn't intervene in World War II for humanitarian impulses, despite the standard narrative that we have. They could have stopped. I mean, there's a big debate. Why didn't they bomb the railway tracks into Auschwitz? Right? They didn't. They could have. It wasn't a priority. But one of the consequences of U.S. intervention in World War II is that a genocide in Europe was brought to an end. One of the consequences, I would argue, of U.S. intervention in the Balkans, whatever you may think about the motives, I think we could probably agree, but the consequences of U.S. intervention in the Balkans was that a genocide was brought to an end. For three years, the Clinton administration saw what was happening. The Bosnians were appealing for what was called, you know, lift and strike, lift the arms embargo, let us sort of defend ourselves, help us. The Clinton administration didn't want to get involved because they explicitly said it. If you go back, and I was deeply engaged in this, they explicitly said, you know, Bosnia concerns our, you know, humanitarian interests. It doesn't concern our national interests. The conflict dragged on for three years. Europe was becoming destabilized. The North Atlantic alliance was coming apart. After three years of watching what was happening, you had Srebrenica, you had a massacre. It looked like the entire Eastern Europe was going to be stabilized. Then Clinton reversed policy effectively. Not because he all of a sudden discovered that there was ugly things happening in Bosnia because there were deep political interests. But a consequence of that was that a genocide was brought to an end. Um, I would argue that every intervention that one could think of in modern history, humanitarian interests are the moral justification that politicians give. But the real motives behind it are political, economic interests. But sometimes those things can overlap and they can have positive consequences um, for people who have no other hope, particularly when you're facing a very brutal state apparatus you want to call it fascist or not fascist. I think the term fascism actually does apply to the case of Syria, but we don't need to get bogged down in that debate. You know, I think if the United States is motivated by some ulterior motive to get involved in some area of the world, and if as a result of that intervention, people who are facing war crimes and crimes against humanity can have some alleviation in their suffering, then that's an intervention that, of course, is not ideal, but if it's going to save human lives, I'm going to support it. That's how I view it. Um, yeah, the Russian question. Yeah, I'll answer very, um, You know, we really don't know. The question, just to remind everyone, is if there is an intervention in Syria, how will Russia react? How will Putin react? We don't really know. My own view is that Russian policy is really motivated less by what's happening in Syria today, any love for the Assad regime and the you know, arms that they sell in that port in Latakia, the Russian naval port. I think it's motivated much more by um, a set of broader concerns in terms of the rules of the international system. Russia wants to make, uh, send a message to the West that they're not going to simply stand by and allow the United States to unilaterally decide which regimes can stand, which can fall. They'll cast their veto. They will you know, 
you know, mm-hmm. raise their voice. But I think if they were pushed, if all of a sudden Obama says, look, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're going to get involved for whatever reasons, economic, humanitarian, I don't think Russia is going to go to war. And there's some evidence that that's the case because when chemical weapons were used in huge quantities this past summer and Obama was threatening airstrikes, um, Russia basically caved in. They didn't do anything. They weren't mobilizing. They couldn't do much. Um, they basically were faced with the fait accompli. And my reading of Russian policy is really that this is an opportunity for Russia to assert itself on the global stage, to organize this conference in Geneva. Russia has, you know, Putin has these you know, delusions of grandeur. Maybe they're true, maybe they're not. Like Russia's great empire civilization. This is Russia's moment. He capitalizes on, on sort of this, 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 this narrative within Russia to consolidate his own power. Um, so I don't see Russia sort of, um, you know, blocking or trying to re- go back to the Cold War days and sort of, you know, you know um, get involved and then you know, deeply affect the, the, the world, start a, a, a global sort of crisis over this. I think a lot of what Russia's been doing is bravado. And like I said, September of last year gives us a sense that Russia probably would, would sort of, you know, okay, They still have that it. base in Latakia? Yeah. They do, yeah, mm-hmm. they do, yeah. But even, you know, Putin has said explicitly, you know, they say, he said in many of his interviews, look at the New York Times piece, actually, that he wrote in September. He said you know, explicitly, we have no particular affinity for the Bashar Assad regime. You know, we're not supporting it because it's something that's deeply in, connected to our economic or geostrategic. I think it's much more political. A lot, of this, a lot of this goes back to Libya and how the Russians sort of deeply upset about what happened in Libya and Gaddafi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I, I completely agree with you. I mean, you know, states have interests and they intervene. Uh, to protect those, and humanitarian sort of motives are very, very secondary. But I agree with Nathan also that, you know, in the end, it can end up being beneficial for people, and not just in the case of the United States. I mean, Tanzania sort of overthrew Idi Amin, not because they were concerned about the Ugandan population, but because he was sort of, you know, being just a pest. India intervened in East Pakistan, not because it was concerned about the East Pakistani population, but because Pakistan, of course, is an arch rival of India, and they were going to cut Pakistan down literally to half its size. But that did stop a genocide in, you know, in East Pakistan, led to the creation of Bangladesh, did stop Idi Amin's misrule, and led to, you know, the Ugandan people at least not having to put up with a complete nutcase. So similarly, in the, in the case of the United States also, you know, it can have beneficial results, even though, of course, the U.S., like, uh, you know, other countries, you know, only intervenes primarily, if not almost completely, you know, to protect its interests. Okay, uh, two more questions or comments. And of course, there was Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia, which yes, one could add to that list. Uh, and David yeah. probably knows, you know, uh, has a whole Trotskyist encyclopedia of the history of such uh, interventions. Right. <laughs> if, uh, uh, go ahead, Jim. My concern, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I kind of abbreviated everything earlier, is that, is, that, that you didn't address, and I'll just reiterate, is what happens after intervention? Mm. After, let's say we go in and do a fantastic military operation and take out Assad, yeah. and that, that's no longer a major, Assad and his, that's, they're no longer a major player in the scene. Then we have a free-for-all? I, I think that's a very important question, and this is why, one of the reasons I, and this is where Nader and I disagree, I actually do not favor uh, an intervention on a macro scale to topple the Assad regime. I, I probably would have favored that much earlier in the Syrian conflict. Re- again, remember that the first eight to nine months of the Syrian uprising were nonviolent, democratic, um, non-sectarian, and non-jihadi. Very important to remember that because um, had there been, there was this was a completely one-sided affair at that point. The violence was an entirely one-way street from the regime to the civilian population. Live ammunition, snipers, um, mass bloodshed inflicted on a civilian population of peaceful protesters. I think at that point, or soon, within the first few months of the uh, armed struggle, there could have been some kind of intervention to stop this killing machine. I think at this point, if there were, let's say, either from, from within or from without, uh, if Assad's regime were to fall, I think what you would have very likely in Syria is a new civil war between the Free Syrian Army, broadly speaking, and the jihadis. 
And I think that could go on for a very long time because the jihadis are not interested in negotiation. They're not interested in political settlements or even in particular political arrangements. It's an apocalyptic, metaphysical uh, struggle to the death. And um, I know which side I would be on in that struggle. Uh, I would be on the side of, of the Syrian, uh, broadly speaking, uh, popular democratic struggle against the, the forces of, 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 uh, of Al-Qaeda. But um, I don't think, and I think this addresses your question, I, I don't think that an intervention, a, an intervention to solve the Syrian crisis, to topple the Assad regime right now, I just don't think that that is possible at this point. If it were possible, what would you do? Well, if it were possible, I, I would support it. Um, and I think it was possible two years ago. But I think that moment is gone, and that, that is not just an observ a casual observation. I think that's actually somewhat of an indictment of the, of the failure to intervene at the time. But, you know, not that these things are simple. Yeah, yeah I would let uh, Nadir Hashmi answer it, because he's the one who's, I think, the most... Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, well exactly. very, very quickly, um, you know, you raise a good point. You don't, you don't want to have a security vacuum so that it becomes a free-for-all, uh, which is why I don't support simply a military intervention to stop the atrocities. You have to have a plan in place for the aftermath. Um, Jimmy Carter um, wrote a fairly good piece on Syria. Most people missed it because it was published a few days before Christmas, but it was in the Washington Post. And he said that, look, the solution to Syria has to involve three key principles. Number one, the principle of self-determination. The Syrians have to be able to determine their own future, some sort of free election. But also, there has to be a plan in place um, for protection of minorities. That has to be part of some arrangement. You just can't have in the aftermath of the toppling of a Saudi massacre of the Alawite minority. Um, but you also have to have a plan for peacekeeping, a security arrangement, and a plan for economic reconstruction. It has to be part of a broader package. So I don't, I don't believe that simply a military intervention of some sort to take out, let's say, the aircraft and topple the Assad regime is a solution because it poses the problem that you just alluded to. It has to be a comprehensive package deal if we are seriously interested in turning that country around. Um, um, so it's a very good question, and I think there are other precedents that we could sort of see in the international community, none of them ideal. Uh, I don't think the example that you used about uh, sex trafficking among UN workers in Bosnia is representative of the role that the international community or the UN played there. Yes, those things did happen, they were ugly, but I don't, I don't think they're representative of the, the, the effort that international, multinational forces played in Bosnia in terms of stabilizing it. Um, so I think we have to be careful about generalizing from very ugly incidents to all forms of international, multinational, UN interventions. Um, so that's how I see it. Another further questions or comments? Did you want to add anything? To no. Oh, um, there are a number of, po of things that peace and human rights activists, progressives, you know, in a community like Madison can do. Um, for one thing, uh, it's important to have this kind of discussion with, you know, our fellow citizens. Um, and if you know people who if you have a discussion about Syria with some people and um, there's interest in having, you know, a house meeting or another forum somewhere, um, you know, please contact me. Um, I'm no expert uh, on it, but I try to, you know, I, I, I try to feel like I know at least, you know, uh, some essentials. I'll be speaking at a Human Rights Day um, during Human Rights Week at uh, East High School uh, the week after next uh, and talking to a class of students there about Syria. Um, we sh uh, can do more, I think, to support uh, organizations on the ground in Syria that are, are trying to alleviate the suffering. Um, again, I would urge you to join with me in trying to get people in our community who are appalled at what's going on to donate to the Syrian American Medical Society. So please take the brochures, and I have more of them at home. And uh, when the warm weather comes, and I'll be doing some tabling on the street, um, 
I'm going to, that's one of the pieces of literature that I'm going to be disseminating. So if, if you can help to get that around the community, that it, that money goes to, you know, uh, alleviate suffering, it, uh, particularly inside the, the 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 bombarded and blockaded zones. There's also an organization um, that's um, uh, headed by a woman named Rafif Georgette. Mm -hmm. She's one of the contributors to the book, The Syria Dilemma, and her, her organization uh, has the acronym Free Syria, although the F-R-E-E -E in the name stands, it's an acronym and it stands for, uh, you know, a, some, a more complex name, but if you just do Free uh, in, in capital letters, uh, in a hyphen, Syria, uh, or you email me and, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link. They have a program called the Jasmine <coughs> Tent where they are trying to provide um, some places inside uh, the country, inside Syria where uh, w women and children can, you know, find sanctuary. Is that a fair descri yeah. des des description? Um, there are numerous um, civil society activist organizations. There's a local coordinating councils inside. Yeah. Which yeah. Rafif is the, she's the English language spokesperson for the local coordination yeah. councils. Yeah. 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 And there are, there, there are numerous websites, there are numerous organizations that now in the age of the internet, you know, it's just a couple of clicks away. Um, there have been efforts to um, solidarize with um, uh, people who have been carrying out Hunger strikes. What I was, was going to mention that the, the suburb. What's the name of the suburb? Amwadamia. <coughs> right. And and actually, there was quite a bit of web uh, e activism around this to um, you know put pressure on the UN and the U.S. State Department and, and so on. Well, on the world, uh, the, the 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 movement started in this town of Mwadamiya. It was actually a Palestinian Syrian self-described citizen journalist um, who goes under the sort of nom de plume or nom de guerre um, 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 Zakari, uh, what is the Kusai. name? Kusai Zakaria. And um, he started a hunger strike in, uh, in Wadamiya um, a couple of months ago. And immediately this triggered a, a, a wave of solidarity um, around the world, principally, interestingly enough, um, centered in, in the Twin Cities, in Minneapolis, with the organization uh, Friends for a Nonviolent World, a very good organization. I think they're the ones who published that piece, the Mojakov, piece the Mojakov um, um, uh, report on Syria and nonviolence. But uh, very interesting, uh, some of you probably are familiar with the Campaign for Peace and Democracy. Gail Daniker, who is, I think, the director of education for Friends for a Nonviolent World, was, was actually one of the co-founders of the Campaign for Peace and Democracy, along with Joanne Landy. But um, this group has really spearheaded a lot of the solidarity activism around these hunger, uh, hunger strikes and, and, and uh, to, to end the starvation sieges in Syria. And there was a, a petition. Kusayd, by the way, did it like 28, I think, or 30-day uh, hunger strike, uh, and, and really uh, really danced right up to the brink um, and finally ended his hunger strike, but it really did set in motion this this very inspiring wave of solidarity activism where people all over the world joined uh, the call. Uh, there was a, a, there were solidarity actions in many countries around the world. Um, we helped organize a press conference at the United Nations with uh, Zahir Salul, who's the president of the Syrian American Medical Society, Ken Roth from Human Rights Watch, um, his wife, Annie, Dr. Annie Sparrow, who has written some of the most, really, I think, compelling things about the medical nightmare in Syria today, the, the outbreak of polio, the Assad regime's attack on the medical profession. It's one of the, one of the biggest nightmares, I think, of the Syrian tragedy is that precisely at a moment when there is the most need for medical um, relief, uh, with the outbreak of polio, malnutrition, uh, you know, mutilated bodies, uh, people dying. Uh, at that very moment, it's basically impossible to practice medicine in Syria today. Doctors are leaving. Um, and Annie Sparrow has written this extraordinary piece about that on the New York Review of Books website. Um, 
and she's now written another piece about, about polio and the, the politics of, of, of why polio is back in Syria. Um, so uh, I would encourage people to um, look at the website of the Syrian nonviolence movement, actually the, the Facebook page, because the website is in Arabic with just one tiny section in English, but the Facebook page of the Syrian nonviolence movement um, uh, links to all of these efforts, this solidarity, hunger strikes, the um, uh, different activities that are going on. One of the essays in the book, um, Amit actually talked about the uncle of Afra Jalabi. Do you know Afra? Uh, sure, Amit, sure, yes. Sure. Uh, uh, Afra Jalabi is um, a Syrian nonviolence activist based in Montreal. She has a very compelling essay in this book on um, voices uh, from Syrian nonviolence activists and really very honestly and poignantly going into the deeply, you know, the misgivings and the soul searching of Syrian nonviolence activists in the wake of, you know, the armed struggle and, and its, its uh, uh, the twists and turns it's taken. Afra, by the way, will be in Chicago on Tuesday night, um, just as a footnote, uh, on a panel at the International House at the, at the University of Chicago. It'll be Afra and Bernadine Dorn okay. oh. and myself um, uh, talking about the situation. Most of the past. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Well, Bernadine is an interesting story. I mean, I wrote this open letter to the peace movement about Syria back in, I think, September. <laughs> And um, Bernadine responded to it. Um, and uh, I was going to write a, a, a reply to Bernadine, and, and I could see it was going to go back and forth. But then we got this invitation to speak in Chicago, and I, I just reached out to her. I, I don't know her well, but of course she's legendary. And um, we, uh, I asked her if she would appear on this panel. With, but, but I also wanted to have a Syrian voice, and so Afra will be there as well. And I, I, you know, Bernadine has actually signed on to this International Solidarity Hunger Strike. And um, I encourage everyone in this room, if you're interested, you can, you can actually do a hunger strike for a day in solidarity with the starving people. Kusai, when he announced that he would be starting this hunger strike, he was asked why. Um, and he said, well, everyone is starving anyway. Why not give it some purpose? Excuse me. Yes. I was told this is a forum, but all the time I've been here, I've only heard two or three people speaking. There's about 20 people here we, who might have something. Just listen for once. And um, there are people here who might have ideas that might actually help. If you're not going to listen, then you'll never know what those ideas are. The forum has been wide open. No, it hasn't been. I have asked repeatedly for people to um, raise their hands if they have a question or a comment. So, I did several times. Uh, well, I'm sorry that I overlooked you. You got up and no, and, and you went. deliberately overlooked. Do you me. have a question or com uh, another, I other have comment? I have a question. Well, comment. why don't you ask it then? Is anyone listening? I am. Yeah. Right. You got the floor. Well, one, you refer to Syrian people. Syria is an artificial country, just as Iraq. There is no Syrian people. There are people who are Sunnis, Shiites, and Kurds. And Christians, Assyrians, various people, and you're trying to find a solution to a specific area. You're not going to find it until you look beyond the borders of Syria, because what's happening there is not unique. It's happened in Lebanon, and Iraq, and Iran, and until there's a multinational task force that can deal with it on a regional scale. You're wasting your time. Nothing's going to get done. You got to have a UN task force. A look at these areas, people who are starving. I know they got armed personnel carriers that can escort food into these areas, and they will do it if it's on a regional scale. It can't be the U.S. because we are not the world policemen. We don't have a moral authority or the resources. It's got to be the United Nations. Um, Do you want to Yeah, just very quickly. Just out of curiosity, how many Syrians have you actually spoken to um, in terms of your claim that you began with that there is no such thing as a Syrian people? I'm just wondering. Very few. Very few, yeah. Because that's what I thought, because if you actually look at the demonstrations that began in Syria, look at the demonstrations in solidarity with Syria around the world by Syrians, 
overwhelmingly those demonstrations, people were carrying Syrian flags. Right, until they're not October carrying Sunni Empire flags. It's all there was no Lebanon or Syria. True, but that was you know almost a hundred years ago. Um, I'm talking about today. The people in Syria. Um, we of course you know when we talk about the people of Syria, what they want, we we can't speak with any specificity because we don't know what the actual what they actually want because there's no democratic you know, system in, in, in place. But generally speaking, just based on the protests... It's about 18 main groups that are fighting each other in Syria. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why they don't get to talk to each other is they can't hear, they're too busy lobbying missiles. Well, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. But there is a Syrian people... Oh, a people, lot more complicated. And I right think pe that. people generally... I mean, there are people... Mo I mean, if you just look at the political statements, I don't know of any sort of um, um, you know, group in Syria that is trying to, you know, claim that there is no such thing as the Syrian people. Every Syrian that I know, even even the you know the people of Bashar al Assad, they claim to be you know, representatives of the Syrian people. But there is a general view that the Syrian people do exist. There's competition and different views over who should you know be the leader of the Syrian people and how we can adjudicate. But there clearly is a, a people who identify with Syria as a as a collectivity. Um, in terms of what you said with respect to intervention and whether the U.S. should get involved, you know, we can, we can have, I think, a serious difference of opinion. They're already um, overdrawn. I agree. I mean, in many ways, I don't think the United States can do it alone or should do it alone. No, they shouldn't. Um, um, but there is a reality that, you know, um, that I sort of see that unless the United States plays some serious substantive role in getting the process started, even if it means convenient yes, meeting, but not alone. nothing will happen. Um, I agree. I think it should be as many countries as possible. Preferably Arab. Pre preferably Arab, preferably without a colonial or imperial imprint or yes. the intervening powers. I agree with you on that. Exactly. Thank, uh, thanks for coming, folks. Um, I wanted to just say, as the moderator, that it's almost quarter after nine, and we've been in session for about an hour and 45 minutes. And so it's my desire that we wrap this all up, you know, within five to ten minutes of this. Absolutely. I'll also just mention that the book, for those people interested in the book, we're not, uh, if you can write a check, we want the checks to be made out to the Syrian American Medical Society, or just S-A-M-S. All of the money from uh, the book sales this evening will go to the Syrian American Medical Society and its efforts in Syria. I also want to thank our volunteers tonight. Uh, Martina Rippin, who, who screens the movies in here. Uh, now we're showing them every other Wednesday. And uh, did I announce Spook is Head by the Door uh, at the beginning? Uh, we're ne uh, next Wednesday um, at 7 o'clock in this room, as part of our Black History Month uh, offerings, uh, we're going to show a, a, a movie that was long suppressed in the United States. It was written by a Chicagoan, black Chicagoan named Sam Greenlee uh, it, it, around 19, in the late 60s. It, the plot is of, in the early 1960s after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the CIA, which was Lily White at that time, supposedly according to Greenlee, um, has to recruit some token blacks. So. Uh, this guy gets recruited to the CIA, uh, he, but he's very political in ways that they, they don't know. He manages to hide it, and he learns all of their, he gets, goes through all of their training and learns all their dirty tricks. And then he quits the CIA, and he goes on and organizes a black guerrilla army uh, that carries out an, 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 an insurrection, urban insurrection in the United States, something which was, of course, uh, not, uh, the worst nightmare uh, scenarios that the, the rulers had at the time, and which is one reason they came, came down so hard on the Black Panther Party. But anyway, we're, the, the, the movie was, was mostly filmed in Chicago and uh, was uh, financed by United Artists, and they didn't really know what the uh, the, these guys were up to. And so when the movie came out, it was, it was snuffed. And it was only available for years in, in pirated uh, copies. And finally, it was, was re-released, uh, you know, about 10, 10, 10 or so years ago. Uh, and so, we're, you know, a lot of a lot of people are not aware of this underground classic. So, Martina and I are going to be showing it here next uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m.
Yeah. Also want to thank uh, Amy Anderson, who uh, designed our uh, our poster and flyers and put up our, our our form on Syria website. I want to thank David Kettler for the uh, the the sound the, the sound box, which I thought we were going to need it because normally they have a loud band in the fountain on Saturday oh. nights. So I want to thank Norm Stockwell, who's here recording this for WORT. And I want to thank uh, Russ Otto from WOU for, for filming it. And at some point, we'll figure out a way to, you know, to get it up on YouTube or something somewhere down the road. And I want to thank Sue Rose, uh, who was uh, uh, banning the, or staffing the table in the back. Uh, so I guess probably at this point we can, unless there's something else that no, somebody wants to no, say, we can adjourn the meeting, and and I suspect that some of us may be going downstairs for, you know, a bit more uh, food and, and beverage. So uh, thank you all for coming. And if you haven't picked up the Syria dilemma, uh, and you and also uh, please do so, and take also take a look at Ahmed's book. Uh, no, Islam means peace. And there's one thing you left out, David. The person who organized the whole thing, David Williams. Such a pleasure. Oh, to be on wonderful, the panel with wonderful, you, wonderful meeting you. Absolutely. Yeah. I have to get you another tour. Oh my God. <laughs>